Okay, so thank you very much for your presentation. We are going to provide some feedback now. Uh, next slide. This is the structure of our presentation. And first, we're going to go briefly on the summary. The next one. Thank you. So I'm just going to be very, very brief here because we already listened to everything we had to listen to. So first, the context is the return of the investor state, principally during uh, since uh, 2010 especially because of emerging countries such as the BRICS and therefore the aim of the paper is shedding light on the transformation of state capitalism in Europe and for doing this the authors employed a methodology of a comparison of the path taken by French SOEs with the ones in three other, other major Western European economies with similar characteristics that made them comparable. Uh, these countries are Italy, Germany and the United Kingdom and they also represent the distinct forms of capitalism in Europe, which is liberal market economies and coordinated market economies. And some of the main results of the... I, I, here, I just need to, to make a comment. We had a different version of the paper. So it was... Uh, the main result uh, in, in that paper was that the process of standardization is a long-standing one, affecting a large number of companies, uh, especially in the sector of utilities and network industries, and that the French state shareholding are numerous and the normalization of this process is stronger compared with the other countries. And especially, uh, one of the reasons provided for this is that the French SOEs are being challenged by the European Commission. Thank you very much uh, for that wonderful paper. We read it and we have found that there are a lot of uh, positive um, critic points that uh, are very valuable. Um, you have heard that it gives a very comprehensive analysis, comparative uh, historical analysis of the four cases. Uh, but one of the things that we found uh, very, which is very systematic is uh, the study of the four cases from a four dimensions framework of SOE governance, which are the variations um, in objectives, capital ownership, and so on. Uh, moving on, uh, we have uh, some comments on the hybridity trait of uh, SOEs, which have been stated in uh, page five of the article, where they state that uh, the development of the criteria for comparison is based on refusal to consider the SOE as a hybrid object between the state and the market. Uh, we dig uh, deep into the literature and we found some, some of the articles or papers that have studied uh, SOEs um, considering the hybrid uh, trait of um, uh, SOE. So we, we was wondering that, uh, don't you think that um, uh, refusing or neglecting the hybrid uh, trait of SOEs could somehow um, fall as into the trap of uh, false dichotomy or let's say more um, simplification? Because in this case, we are just uh, focusing on um, SOEs from uh, like considering them only as any other uh, co company, um, but neglecting the fact that uh, these um, organizations, they are usually being supported by the government and they have this, um, uh, let's say, privilege that uh, in some cases they are also being affected uh, or negatively influenced for, for, from the political perspective and also the IMF uh, also points out to the, um, let's say, the corruption which happens in these sort of organizations. Uh, don't you think um, um, we wanted to know that uh, your rationale of refusing this uh, specific trait of um, SOEs? And also, we are also wondering that how would the scenarios would be different uh, if you accept this hybrid nature of SOEs? And also, uh, looking at the hypothesis, the, the paper provides uh, three hypotheses. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, the, the paper, it's, it's the first uh, draft and uh, it uh, needs some refinement. Uh, but the first hypothesis uh, states that standardization depends on uh, local institutions and the paper provides a very well um, exploration and analysis of how standardization depends on local institutions in these four countries and in several cases. Um, however, we also thought that uh, the global market trends, which are also uh, indicated in the first page of the uh, paper, that uh, stating the BRICS as a factor uh, on legitimization of SOEs in European countries, and uh, um, and the fact that China, for example, just a case uh, from uh, BRICS, uh, you can uh, take a look at how successful uh, Chinese case war ha has been. 
Uh, like for example, this one is um, 82 firms uh, which are directly um, state-owned SOEs in China which are listed in uh, Fortune Global 500 which shows uh, their success. And for example, you can take a look at the profitability of the SOEs in China. Um, you can see the slope of state-owned holding um, uh, organizations in China and also the Furian and also the rest and also profit per employee in China. Um, in Ch Chinese um, SOEs, um, and uh, we were wondering that um, how these uh, global market trends and also this um, international uh, changes ha has a positive or negative effect on uh, standardization in uh, European countries. And uh, that's, we understand that it's very difficult to balance uh, the common trajectories and also the national diversity of each country and also each case. That's why we have a question of like, how can we best balance studying common trajectories versus national diversity and institutional context in the analyzing SOE transformation across the comparative uh, countries. And in addition to this, uh, we also thought that uh, the influence of international players such as European Commission and also OECD and also European Union uh, has also have a different effect on standardization in uh, European countries. Um, our colleague will further explain this. Yeah, just to further elaborate on the data, this is not like a direct critique, but it's more like a comment to broaden the context. So yeah, we were wondering about the role of international organizations. For example, in the paper, there are two mentioned, which are the OECD and the European Commission. And uh, for instance, the the authors highlight that these institutions disseminate normative discourses about SOEs. And for example, in this quote of the OECD, we can see how they do it. Um, however, the role of these uh, organizations into the analysis is just like uh, taken superficially. So to expand on this, we would like to comment that, for instance, there are other is international organizations playing a role in uh, in regards of this uh, implementation of private criteria to the public sphere such as the WTO the IMF and the World Bank mm -hmm. and uh, yeah so we would like to to have like more more insights more insights regarding this next one <laughs> thank you and the other comment about the context, which is also like a little bit about the methodology, is the case in other European countries. Because, for example, we can see that in other Europeans, the European countries there are more changes, more extreme in relation to, to the governance of SOES. For instance, the European Commis Commission stated that um, the most changes it has been in the direct government and control over business enterprises in Europe is in Czech Republic, Portugal, the Netherlands, Hungary, Belgium and Greece. Uh, you can see this in the lower figure in, on the slide. And this one is a map that shows the uh, scope of the sectors in the economy where SOEs are present. This is in 1998 and this is in 2013. This was also, this was also taken from the European Commission. And so you can see that, uh, sorry, the darker the color is the more sectors in the economy where SOEs are present. Uh, so for example, you can see that there has been uh, more extreme changes in countries just uh, such as Spain, Austria and Denmark, just to mention a few of them. So yeah, we understand that these cases doesn't mean like certain criteria to be comparable to France. Uh, as, as you mentioned that you were looking cases with similar characteristics to compare the case of French SOES. SOEs. But yeah, we think that if the goal is to study the transformation of the state capitalism in Europe, some of these countries should be considered for further research. Uh, I will take it from here. So uh, the next, the, the points that I'm about to present are not points of critique, but but rather for uh, extending the discussion. And I just feel like it's very important to discuss these points when it comes to SOEs. Uh, so first of all, when I was reading the paper, I got the impression, so whenever there is um, uh, an enterprise that is failing, the government just steps in and rescues it. However, I think it very much depends on the government effectiveness and the level of the corruption in the economy. Unfortunately, uh, 
This is uh, very common in developing countries, and um, I'm from Uzbekistan, and SOEs uh, as a structure is not very effective there. Uh, maybe it's a very extreme case, so uh, up until 2016, we were more like a Soviet-style economy uh, with a lot of SOEs, so the government monopoly was almost in all sectors. And then uh, the new government decided to adhere to the ideas of market liberalism for attracting investors and everything, But and um, they adopted a strategy, which is a strategy of privatization of SO SOEs, so 75% of them um, uh, has have to be uh, sold and uh, the government says it's just for like following this market liberalism but I believe that d the state does not have enough money now for financing uh, SOEs any further we have aging infrastructure and the problem is that privatization in this case is not a solution because uh, if you remember the 90s like when Russia with this massive privatization programs when the new uh, social class emerged oligarchs uh, this increased the uh, social inequalities and like it just brought about a lot of problems so this is the risk that we we might also have the same thing in in uzbekistan so we stuck in this inefficiency uh, vicious circle so we our soes are not effective and the privatization has also a lot of risks yeah and there was like a study that actually proves this point in many uh, post-communist states Privatization programs do not lead to uh, industrial restructuring, unfortunately, and lead to negative impact in, on economic growth and state capacity. Uh, the next thing, uh, I think it's also important to talk about how um, SOEs pay taxes, because there are a lot of studies for different countries showing that SOEs are not good taxpayers. And two recent studies on German SOEs show that yeah, it is the case. They are very recent. And why this is important is that because um, you contribute to the public funds, right? You pay taxes. And this, then these money are given to the SOEs. And then uh, they uh, do not pay taxes, like enough taxes, tax avoidance. And this leads to overall uh, falling tax revenue. That means financing SOEs uh, in the long term becomes... I mean, it's not very sustainable in the long term. And with increasing state ownership, especially after the global financial crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic, we, uh, we see that this is an issue we should address. So when we talk about the standardization of SOEs, we should pay attention like, on to uh, designing a very good tax gov governance agreements. That's extremely important. Um, yeah, and just, I like providing examples. So one example from the Netherlands in 2018, uh, there was um, an investigation. So Dutch Railways, I can't really pronounce the name, so I will just call it NS. So NS, it's an example of SOE. It's 100% uh, like the, the sole owner, um, shareholder of uh, S this SOE is Dutch Ministry of Finance. So this SOE receiving money uh, from this ministry. But the problem is what NS did, they created, uh, um, let's say, a subsidiary, which is NS Financial Services, and um, all the financial transactions were going through this subsidiary, and it was registered in Ireland because uh, it's a tax haven, and for 10 years, uh, NS and Dutch SOE was paying taxes to the Irish government while receiving money from the, uh, the Dutch government. So that's... Um, and this led to the loss of around uh, 177 million, but to, according to other estimates, around 300 million euros. So this money, uh, the Dutch government lost this much money. Yeah. And another thing that in our joint seminars, we talk a lot about the ecological problems and uh, the climate change. And uh, this is very important, and uh, a lot of governments, like especially in the EU, seem to care about uh, this problem. However, when you see headlines like this, you'd be like, government is involved in SOE, and now it just seems like it goes against its own agenda. It doesn't make sense, right? So I will stop here and uh, yeah, give the floor to Russia. Um, so um, in addition to previous comments, um, as let's say honest readers, we also have some uh, other comments. Um, and the first thing is that uh, the paper focuses more uh, or bases its uh, conclusion and um, let's say discussions based on secondary data, historical reports and other um, documents. 
But uh, that's why we, we were thinking that, uh, especially when it comes to these very, let's say, socio-economic and political um, uh, aspects of the SOEs, it would be, uh, don't you think it would be better to have some um, interviews, uh, let's say, unstructured interviews with experts and policymakers in the EU or uh, other um, arenas to deepen the analysis? And also the fact that uh, the paper we received is uh, that I think it lacks a specific um, section for discussion, although it uh, discusses every part in its specific um, uh, section, for example, Italy, Fran France, Germany. But still, uh, I think we need a specific uh, section of discussions where it can include uh, the final analysis. And also, it would be much better to have a table where it could uh, summarize all the points and also including the four dimensions of SOE's uh, governance. I think uh, uh, for me as a reader, it would be much easier to understand the whole picture. And also, uh, we read it and we found it's very dense in terms of writing. Uh, yeah, it's the first um, uh, first draft. That's why uh, we have these comments. Probably you, also, you already have uh, foc focused about uh, solving these comments in the future uh, drafts. So, and also um, the last comment uh, we have is that uh, there, um, the analysis is scattered across like uh, different um, cases from different industries. Uh, and uh, you have um, very well established in the first uh, pages that uh, you, have, you have taken a comparison point, which is France, and you're uh, studying other cases using that specific comparison point. And we were thinking that uh, what if uh, you also create another uh, comparison point of a specific case? For example, we have uh, industries, for example, banks, we have trains, for example, airplanes, of several, um, several uh, companies with different nature, uh, banks, for example. And uh, what if um, the analysis could have a comparison point of a specific uh, company from a specific industry and then you can compare it with other. It wouldn't, don't you think it would? Uh, it wouldn't lead to more generalized um, uh, results, and it would be more specific and applicable to maybe to other um, cases and countries. And with that, uh, we would like to leave you with our open questions. Shall we read them, or or would you like to read them? <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, we will read them then. Okay, what? What criteria were considered when selecting the companies and the countries? Because we see that some of the countries, they have some, some kind of different, um, let's say, um, market. Uh, for example, uh, UK has very liberal uh, type of economy and in terms of SOEs and Germany have more coordinated one. And we were thinking that what were the criteria for the countries and the companies? And also, how can we best balance, which is the same question that I po proposed before, and the next question is, how do international organizations constrain or shape national SOE governance options, especially for international firms, internationalized firms? And can, can it be expected that institutions such as the European Commission shape the future trajectories of SOEs in the European Union, especially when it comes to this um, competition with the um, BRICS and other countries? And what could be the potential scenarios? And also, what can policymakers do about the tax avoidance, which um, you have uh, well established? And what do you think of other European countries having similar distinct trajectories? A very general question. Thank you. Okay. So maybe you Thank have you. 10 minutes, so we have sufficient time for yeah, the open yeah, discussion. Yeah, we'll try to That's make fine. it quite quick and with, uh, uh, with Scott. Uh, I will first uh, make a first round of answers and then uh, if Scott uh, want to uh, add some points. Uh, well, okay, um, very big questions, Go good questions actually. Um, first, um, I will try to just make Scott appear somewhere uh, in order to up. Yeah, you're here. Uh, okay, well, uh, I will try to make a first round of, of answers. Um, okay, uh, hybridity. Why we don't want to use hybridity? Um, first, because it's not a good characterization. Saying that something is hybrid is not saying much, actually. It, what is the characteristic of something which is hybrid? Some part of something and some, some, some part of something else. 
it's not a very good characterization from a theoretical point of view. Hybridity, I think, is a very bad concept. It cannot be a concept, actually. And second point, it's based on the idea that you have the state, the public, and the private, the market. There are two different uh, things, and sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't. And actually, from a sociological point of view, I'm not absolutely convinced of that. Actually, when you look at the long-term history, markets and states develop all together. So the idea that state on the, on, on the one side, and if you are a liberal, you will say state is bad and market is good. If you are a socialist, you will say state is good, market is bad. OK, but actually, in the long-term history, you don't have state without markets and markets without states. Uh, and moreover, most, in, in, if we look in the French case, and the French case show that very well, because if you look at the elite of the economic system and the elites of the administrative organizations, they are the same persons. And actually, you have always people going from one to the other and so on and so forth. And in most economies, it's quite, you have differences, but this clear border between the state and the market is never really as clear as it can, see, as is, as it can seem. So the idea is taking this point as an entry point rather than saying then uh, taking as a, an entry point the idea that you have a market from one side and the, uh, 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 and the state on the other. Um, so uh, on the pressure of international organization, I will try to make it quite quick. Uh, we must see the things differently from one country to another and one organization to another. If we take European countries, okay, the OECD is uh, important because it gives legitimacy to some changes or not. But it's not a very strong pressure. It's an ideological pressure. That's it. But what is very important is the European Commission. Here you have strong pressures and strong negotiations because it's not something which is outside the states. The states negotiate things. Uh, and uh, it's more interesting to see the European part, uh, the EU part, as an arena for negotiations between states, between states and firm, and so on. And as we said, what's interesting is that in the French case, you have uh, quite strong pressure for the, from the European Commission because French SOEs are international firms. And the action of the French state through, states, through French SOEs has impacts on uh, other countries. When states, in the Italian case, where SOEs are more local firms, actually the European Commission says, well, do what you want. And you see there is some kind of uh, different kind of. Uh, and as far as uh, IMF and the World Bank are concerned, actually from the French case, we don't really see them directly because we don't have the issue that there can be in some uh, 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 other states. Um, SOEs are not always effective. Yes, we don't say it's always effective, but we also don't say it's always ineffective. And we actually say that um, studying SOEs through the lens of efficacy, effectiveness, uh, is a really a short-sighted way of uh, looking to SOEs. You have some uh, period of history or some situations in which uh, privatizations made uh, firms more efficient and some other cases in the which nationalizations make them more efficient. So you cannot have a general um, idea that SOEs are inefficient or SOEs are efficient. It depends on the situations and at some point a, ch a change in the structure of capital uh, brings changes in the organization and uh, uh, makes the organization more efficient in one uh, way or on a, another. Um, and it, at some point we can even say that privatizations or nationalization trends often happen at a, at a moment when the dominant organization nationalized or privatized uh, big 
uh, begins to be to appear as not as efficient as we could have hoped. So at some point, uh, we uh, we have changes that uh, that's what we we saw with uh, uh, the different cases. Um, yes, for, I really like the. Uh, Netherlands uh, railway system case. I didn't really know it, so thank you. Uh, because it's really a very good example of what we say, is that we have a normalized firm, which is a state-owned firm, what, but which do, does tax avoidance like any other firm. So it's a really well norm normalized firm. And it's the problem with the normalization process, is that at some point, if you have normal firm, they do, for instance, tax avoidance like any other firms, and French SOEs do tax avoidance also. So uh, uh, it's a very good example of what we say, and it's a... Uh, really. um, okay. Um, uh, for, yeah, uh, you said secondary data. Actually, uh, on the French case, it's really uh, primary data. Uh, we made... Uh, hundreds of interviews and so on in the administration, in the firms and so on. We have uh, a huge primary data for uh, the French case. That's true that for other comparative cases, we have only uh, secondary data. And I agree with you, it's a problem. But it's why uh, we said it's a preliminary work. Uh, uh, but it's a way to... Actually, our main focus is on France for various reasons. But we wanted to uh, uh, test our model with uh, other cases. So, but it, the, 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 the heart of the, uh, of, the uh, of the work is on the French and we have many uh, much uh, uh, primary data. Um, and as far as ecology is concerned, um, it's uh, like I said for other things before. The same thing that we cannot say that SOEs are per se um, efficient or not efficient, they are not ecological or not ecological. If you take Saudi Aramco, the Saudi, Saudi, uh, Saudi uh, uh, um, uh, oil company, I don't think we can say they are ecological. But what's interesting from an ecological point of view or from an environment point of view is that if, as a state, you want to um, transform the economy, transform the structures of the economy directly, SOEs are a very powerful tool. So I think uh, it would be a pity not to use this uh, tool in order to uh, 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 transform the economy from an ecological point, ecological point of view because it's a very efficient tool of public policy. And it's what has been. It has been uh, in France, for instance, in the 1940s, 50s. It was a very powerful tool for changing the course of the economy, on, not at all in, a, in a, an ecological uh, direction, but uh, it shows that uh, it's a very uh, powerful tool for for uh, uh, deep change uh, on the economics in, in the economic structures of, of of a country. I don't know, Scott, if you want to add something on one point or the other. <laughs> yeah, just a comment on the Uzbekistan case. I, I found quite interesting because uh, you said that the corruption, the the, the, the the SOEs were not effective, and privatization was not the solution. And actually, let's. A good example, what we say that internal transformation transformation of the government firms are more important than um, their owners. So that what is important is not that the French is an SOE or not, is the way what's important is the way it's um is governed. And uh probably in the Uzbekistan case, um the solution would be to transform these firms uh but it could be uh it could be the work of a private shareholder or it could be um the result of governmental actions so i think uh another another way to to make our point is to say that the literature is mainly focusing on privatization or nationalization and on state ownership but in the end, what uh, seems more important to us is that 
is the way firms are firms have governed, and there's why uh, there's another another uh, way to explain why we do not use hybrid. Um, uh, we're gonna say SOEs are hybrid because uh, they're firms uh, like other firms, and maybe um, the firms owned by families have different features, um, but maybe not, uh, and it's probably not um, the best. It says much about state capitalism, but at the same time, um, the ownership doesn't say much about the way a firm is governed. Um, that's what we say. Thank you very much. So I will open the floor to, <laughs> oh gosh. Um, <laughs> so I think, yeah, please keep, uh, keep in mind that you're not alone in the room and that yeah, you keep your questions at a marks pointed. I think I will do two rounds of three things and prioritize female voices. So I will. Hello, thank you. I'm Gabriela. I'm from El Salvador, and I was wondering if you know about policies that actually work for coming back from privatization, more in countries that were a lot influenced by United States because, for example, I was thinking in my country, uh, we, well, the government in the 90s basically privatized every state company. And I'm wondering how feasible it is to come in back a state of companies and if they can compete, for example, in sectors like energy or be inefficient. Thank you. Hello, I am Pranandita, I'm from India, and I have two questions, both of them were alluded to a bit by the discussants. The first is about corruption. So what I understood from your presentation that in the four countries that you mentioned, the trend towards nationalization or privatization again happens when there is a lot of public support for nationalization when privatization seems to have failed, when the, the railways are breaking down, then there is public support for nationalization. Whereas in my country, I think, at least in a section of the population, the biggest or one of the most important arguments against nationalization is always about corruption. And uh, government, just the government is seen as being a lot of red tape and very corrupt. So I'm wondering whether that is not relevant at all in the European context. And the second is, uh, because you mentioned a lot of countries, China and the fact that this is completely absent in the US, but um, how about the Eastern European countries that have, uh, uh, this uh, Soviet legacy, but also they went through shock therapy. So what is the role of the state right now? I think one more. Then. Hi, uh, my name is Max and uh, from Germany. My question was that like with the new wave of like re or partial renationalization after the 2010s, like these new or rediscovered forms of, of state-owned enterprises, they seem to serve very different purposes than the older ones. Like what has happened to the notion of, of like public purpose and public goods um, and how, like, like why, do not, why do they not seem to fulfill this role the same way as um, they did in the post-war era? Okay, I think that's good for the first round. So. Uh, well, um, I, I'm not absolutely sure I understood your question, so I, maybe I, I will. Uh, you wanted to speak about, uh, are there examples of privatization that work? That, is that the central point? Or? Coming back from privatization, that's uh, uh, Turning to a state owned something? Ah, a case when it, when it works. Uh, I don't know, uh, for example, now I will. Um, actually, uh, you know, in France, for instance, I will take the French case because it's the one I know more. Um, you have, uh, when we see the moment, the period of time when uh, firms were nationalized, uh, most of the time it was uh, uh, situations in which uh, private firms were not working very well. And actually, the state intervention and the nationalizations made these firms uh, work much better. 
the case for the railway system in the 1930s. It's true for uh, the industry in the 1980s, um, with uh, the state having a, a, a strong uh, uh, power, capital, uh, economic, financial power, uh, uh, regulation, regulationary power, in order to uh, uh, organize uh, uh, sectors or uh, firms. So. Uh, um, it's quite um, uh, um, surprising when you see the literature to see that uh, in some cases, yes, uh, the state can be a, a, a better organizer of the econo of uh, industry. In some cases, not in all ways, uh, uh, than, uh, um, uh, than uh, private companies. Um, the issue of corruption, yeah. I, I'm Actually, first, uh, private firms can be corrupted too. <laughs> uh, and second, um, yes, in the, in the Italian case, for instance, the issue of uh, direct uh, politician intervention uh, uh, in clientelist uh, perspective uh, has been a problem uh, in several cases. So it's, um, in France, it can be at some point. Uh, we, we had a big uh, uh, tri uh, affairs about uh, uh, the uh, um, oil uh, companies and uh, system, or in the, or the industry of. Uh, um, in the 1990s, we had many affairs about how political parties were financed, uh, and so on. So yes, of course, it, it, it's an issue. Uh, um, is it a reason why we should say that uh, state-owned companies are, have more problems than private companies? Uh, I'm not absolutely sure, but is what we said, it really depends on the institutional context. And maybe in India, if you say so, I don't know, I don't really know India enough, but maybe the institutional uh, uh, context make that the issue of, co of corruption and of lack of trust in the state or in uh, the uh, state administrations make it uh, worse uh, having uh, uh, state-owned enterprises than uh, private co companies in order to uh, uh, make public policies or I don't know. Uh, so it depends on, on, on the situation, on, on, on the context. Uh, and uh, it one specificity of the French case is actually uh, the very strong and quite independent state administration. Actually, m most of the government, the day-to-day -day government of state-owned enterprises is really uh, uh, dealt with by the state administration without strong intervention of uh, politicians. Uh, you, we have, uh, I don't know. Um, okay, just another way to answer the question yeah. is that uh, when sort of about opinion about and the way um, uh, SOEs are legitimate or not, we're not speaking about general opinion, the general public. Uh, actually, studies on France, um, if you look at polls, uh, for example, um, the public has always been in favor of, uh, of state enterprises, um, in favor of nationalization versus privatization. Um, so it's more of a matter of what the political parties, um, how do they deal with the idea of privatization, nationalization, and what the state's administration thinks and does. Um, so in the case of corruption, if the government is corrupt, um, have any incentive to uh, well to privatize or to deal with the, the idea of, of corruption in SOEs? Um, the last point I wanted to make is about a new purpose when uh, with renationalization. Re that's exactly what we we argue actually that uh, these transformations of the conception of control of state-owned enterprises and this uh, process of normalization make it difficult to, uh, even when we renationalize or nationalized firm, to make it uh, tools of public policy as it was before, uh, because it's even when you nationalize firm, the general idea is that it should be 
either uh, very limited in its scope or uh, being uh, uh, the, as normal as possible. So, um, and it goes with the question we about environment and ecology, uh, redirecting, uh, um, uh, using this firm as tools of public policy is quite difficult with this uh, 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 general conception uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, SOEs today. Yeah. And this is the question also of uh, railways in Netherlands. So yes, when you have public enterprises that do this kind of thing, what it's really the purpose. And so there's probably a, a need for new transformation, but you know you have a situation, as Scott said, uh, most of the uh, recent nationalization, while well, nationalization which were quite reluctantly made. It was not really wanted. It was reluctantly made because firms were on the verge of, bon of bankruptcy or something like that. And actually the states don't really know what to do with that. And uh, one question is having SOEs, yes, but what to do with them? It's not absolutely uh, obvious. But uh, in the energy system, we see deep transformation in the last years in the French case with the strong idea that it's a way to rebuild a, a new nuclear reactor so we have to to, to recreate an energy sector uh, an electricity sector uh, uh, led by the state in order to, to to deal with this policy here you have something which is emerging but it's not uh, uh, always the case and most of the time that really does not really know what to do with this and that because they are the politicians and the civil servants they have in mind the idea that the market is more efficient. And that's uh, it's not really more. Uh, yes, I don't know about your, your, your Eastern European countries. I don't think I, I don't think I have much to, to answer you. That's why I didn't answer. So uh, yes, it was a privatization. Uh, uh, so it's a catastrophe, actually. So in most of the countries. So yes, and we we all know that. Uh, yeah, uh, Russian dictatorship is partly uh, the the consequences of this shock therapy in the 1990s and the private, the brutal privatization of the whole economy and the destruction of uh, the, that's why we, in the European cases, West European cases, the difference is that the transformation was more, were most of the time uh, quite uh, slower uh, and more co uh, coordinated and more domestically led. Uh, it was not, uh, yeah, so yeah, uh, and in the Eastern European country, we, we, we had the situation in which most of the economy wire was state on enterprise, and when you privatize everything in, in two or three years, uh, you absolutely destroy the economy. So you provoke a very difficult and situation. And trying to gather with markets, uh, the introduction of market logics uh, as well. So it's not only privatization, but also the introduction mm -hmm. of markets. So yeah, it's. Actually. Okay, we have four more minutes, so some quick questions behind here. Anybody else? Um, thank you for the presentation. I am Fazli from Uzbekistan. Um, my question is on um, specific uh, function of state-owned companies when for example, comparing state-owned companies in France, UK, and Germany to that of uh, China, Russia, or other oil-producing companies, uh, countries, um, would you say a particular difference is to push the state politics, and through which there is a case uh, in these countries to keep or overfinance those state-owned companies in the global market? 
Um, hi, uh, my name is Jan from Colombia. I have a question. Do you think that uh, the attitude to our create new state-owned enterprises or make them bigger has changed recently? Uh, because after the COVID, I think everybody realized that there are strategic sectors in the economy, such as pharmaceutical industries or energy, and that actually having state-owned companies in the in these sectors may may allow to protect like the public interest. So could you think that after the pandemic, basically the attitude has changed or basically reminds the same about uh, the one that you presented before? Uh, thank you. Okay, you can. Yes, I'm not absolutely sure I understood your question actually uh, about emerging countries and um, so particularly the difference bet between uh, the state-owned companies in Europe and as of Russia and China, for example, being uh, those state-owned companies in Russia or China, for example, are particularly uh, financed to push state politics. Mm -hmm. And this is the case for them to finance them and keep the public opinion. So, okay. Um, yeah, the COVID crisis actually was, uh, I will answer both questions. Uh, COVID crisis, yes. Uh, uh, I think it's one of uh, the elements of a possible uh, return of uh, uh, more uh, public policy to use of, of state of enterprises. Uh, it's not yet the case, actually. Um, and uh, what's interesting, you, you use the, the, the word uh, strategic. And what is interesting when you look at the debates about set on enterprises, this word always pop, pops up at some point, uh, but it always changes what it means. So what is strategic is what you say is strategic. So in some point it will be the defense procurement, in some ways it will be uh, health uh, and uh, medicine and so on. Um, what I... I, uh, I see is that um, even with the pandemic, um, the states in Europe remain also because of the constraint of the European Union, but not, not only, also for domestic reasons, remain really reluctant to the idea of uh, renationalizing these kind of sectors. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't feel like there is a, a, a deep uh, U-turn in, in this point. Um, about uh, state politics, um, it depends what you say. So it, uh, in, in the Chinese case, um, of course there is uh, poli um, state politics like controlling the economic elites, for instance, but a central point of SOEs in China is developing the market and developing the economy on the international scale. Uh, actually, the French SOEs do the same. It's a way of uh, uh, developing the economy on the international scale. Uh, and when, you s when I say that I spoke about public policy purpose, it's also uh, 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 the question of influence. Uh, is also true. Uh, uh, I think that in the French economic el uh, in French administrative elite, there is the idea that if we have strong national firms, it will uh, participate to uh, the uh, uh, radiance of France, to its uh, uh, economic power. Uh, to uh, so, uh, it's always difficult to uh, uh, separate. Actually, what is uh, um, state politics and what is not, um, and uh, but the idea of normalization is the idea of getting rid of this state politics. But when you get rid of, sometimes it gets back uh, from the windows when you, yeah, you know, and yeah, historically, uh, yeah, uh, for French energy firms uh, in Africa, they were part of the fr French, uh, France, Afrique uh, system, so. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott, if you want to add something, on, no, it's okay. Thank so, you very much. Yeah.
I think we're done. Thanks for the talk, for answering our question, and we will be start again in 13 minutes. <laughs> Thank you.